Welcome to the 11th talk in the inaugural webinar series presented by the International Adsorption Society. The IAS is an international organization dedicated to advancing adsorption as a solution to scientific, engineering, and human welfare challenges through the promotion of adsorption research and education. We hope that all of our attendees, their families, and their colleagues are safe amid the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Today's webinar will be presented by Professor Stefan Kaskel of TU Dresden and Fraunhofer IFW. I'm Daniel Sidarius of NIST in the United States and the Secretary Treasurer of the IAS. Questions to our speaker will be moderated by Isabel Harryhausen of Max Planck Institute in Magdeburg and Nicholas Wilkins of the University of Alberta. We are required to remind attendees and future viewers that the views expressed by the speaker, host, or other moderators are not necessarily those of the IAS or of the institutions associated with those individuals. We ask that you consider joining the IAS as a regular member if you are not already. Our dues are minimal, only 20 US dollars per year, but support the publication of our flagship journal, Adsorption, contribute to travel grants and workshop seed funding for IAS members and affiliated groups, as well as aid the organization of our triennial conference on the fundamentals of adsorption. Members also receive free access to IAS supported materials, including our journal, as well as the adsorption database published by Springer Materials. Anyone can follow the IAS on Twitter for future updates regarding IAS events, webinars, and information about scientific meetings. Please help expand our YouTube channel by subscribing. Additionally, we ask that you would help us evaluate this webinar series by taking the online survey at the bit.ly URL shown on screen. This link is also available on IAS Twitter. We will use the survey results in planning for future webinar series and other IAS events online. During today's webinar, questions can be submitted to the speaker via the Q&A tab of the Zoom client or as comments on YouTube, and those comments will be forwarded to the Zoom hosts. Questions will be addressed midway through the webinar and then again following the end of the presentation. And now I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker. Professor Stefan Kaskel is a professor of inorganic chemistry at Technical University Dresden and the head of the chemical surface and reaction tech business unit of the Fraunhofer Institute. Professor Kaskal is recognized as a leading researcher in the synthesis, characterization, and applications of MOFs, and especially in recent years of MOFs that exhibit structural flexibility. He is a co-author on more than 500 publications and has trained numerous doctoral students and postdoctoral researchers. Today, he will present on switchability and ultra high porosity in metal organic frameworks. And with that, I'm gonna ask Stefan to begin sharing his screen and you have control of the webinar. Okay, I hope you can hear me all well, and uh, I hope you can see the screen now. <clears throat> well, first of all, I would like to thank the IAS for organizing this great webinar series. I think this is already a wonderful success. I hope you are all healthy. And uh, what, I, what I would like to try to do today is to distract you a little bit from the corona pandemic topics and news and try to dive into the topic of switchability and ultra high porosity in the field of metal organic frameworks, which is a field that fascinates me for many years. And I will try to guide you into the field, but at the same time also describe some of the open questions. And I think this field is also yeah, plentiful and has many open questions which uh, young researchers but also experienced re researchers might address and I'm also quite interested um, for your feedback of course. I've organized my presentation in, a, in two sections basically because IAS has asked me for a break in between. So first I will talk a little bit about the ultra high porosity, the concepts and what type of materials show ultra high porosity, what is ultra high porosity. And then I will dive into the field of switchable metal organic frameworks. I will describe a few model materials and phenomena, but then I will also describe and uh, give a tutorial insight into some of the in situ technologies that are key basically to understand and follow, to view the 
moving MOFs and, and their structural changes. And then in the second part of my presentation after the Q&A session, I will go to the more advanced topic, which are the counterintuitive absorption phenomena. And here I will um, kind of outline what is the strength of in silico design and rationalization, but also give a perspective and um, show what are the open questions in the field and what we can still or still have to learn. So Philip Llewellyn gave a wonderful introduction into metal organic frameworks um, a few days ago, and I don't want to repeat that. Um, but as a brief introduction into MOFs, what is fascinating about MOFs is that they are modular. They, they are inorganic chemistry clusters, plenty of inorganic chemistry clusters, uh, like these pedal wheel clusters in the early days of MOFs, and then also this zinc 4 cluster in the early day, days of MOFs only need to be combined with the multitude of organic linkers, for example, trifunctional linkers, bifunctional linkers that can be extended or even further functionalized. And uh, this uh, materials class basically creates plenty of uh, materials, over 20, 30,000 MOFs are known today, or even some people quote 70,000 MOFs that are known today. Um, which then probably are not all porous, but uh, I, I think there are at least 20,000 uh, porous materials. I would like to uh, show you in the beginning two general books. Uh, one from one of the pioneers in the field, Umayagi, of course, this is a very recent book. Um, he calls this type of chemistry reticular chemistry. And it's a more personal perspective. And then um, this book I edited in 2016, which is uh, a contributed book from many chapters, from many leading authors in the field all over the world, also from Umayagi, giving insight into the structural chemistry, some of the properties and the design uh, criteria. I also would like to point out that there is an ISA MOF group um, the International Zeolite Association. You can also find some information there. This website is still under development uh, and needs improvement, but you can find some basic information also about the databases uh, and links there. Um, giving credit to the development of MOFs, we have to say that uh, among the early researchers in this field were by Kinoshita, uh, reporting the first type of coordination polymers already uh, in the 60s of the last century. And then, of course, the work of Robson and Kepert, uh, working more on the development rational design of coordination polymers with indications of porosity. But then also, of course, the most important work by Kitagawa and Yagi and Ferrey, who really developed the ultra high or the very high porosity in these type of materials with uh, surface area, specific surface area already succeeding, um, uh, superseding the traditional adsorbents like zeolites and activated uh, carbons. And at that time, it was also uh, rationalized that uh, stability, chemical stability becomes more important. The zirconium MOFs by Lillerud were discovered. And uh, as I said, nowadays, we have more than 20,000 MOFs. Some of them are quite stable and the applications are developed in various uh, fields. Originally, there was a very early development on gas storage by BSF, and you can see some information of that still on uh, YouTube. However, uh, BSF has turned over this business to uh, other companies. And uh, luckily, many, many small startups have started to work in the field, um, focusing also on niche applications. Probably the earliest one was MOF Technologies, then also uh, Framergy, Numa technology is probably nowadays the biggest startup in this field, and there are many more. Um, I think uh, at least a dozen of small startup companies are active in the field. What is also in the state of the art of MOFs uh, quite important is that, of course, in the, in the early days, only milligram of these materials were available. In the uh, 20, uh, around 2000, then, also uh, gram scale and then kilogram scale became available. So uh, in the last 10 years, uh, plenty of papers de dealt with upscaling materials. And uh, nowadays, I think we can say that uh, at the ton scale, these type of materials are available. Um, a few companies are producing them on the ton scale for applications in uh, gas storage or uh, separation applications. In Germany, 
MOF research was promoted by two um, programs, uh, funding 30 to 40 research groups. The first one started already in 2008, and the second one, the most, most recent one, is the Cornets program. You can also find the web pages here and also the people involved in, in these type of um, themes. If uh, you are interested to buy MOFs, of course, here's also a small advertisement from my university. Um, we um, deliver Metal Organic Framework since 2012. Uh, you can buy uh, up to several kilogram MOFs from us, uh, also in shaped form and granules, uh, spheres, for example, but also in textiles. This is not so much educational, of course, in, in terms of tutorial, but maybe there's someone who needs a kilogram or even up to 50 kilograms we can produce from our, just contact our material center at uh, Theo Dresden. Now, introducing the early work from my laboratory, for us, quite a milestone was the development of this material called DUT6. So all these MOF uh, scientists have this local patriotism to call their MOFs after the local university. So this stands for Dresden University of Technology. And for us, it was quite a milestone because for the first time we achieved 4,000, more than 4,000 square meters uh, per gram surface area in this kind of hierarchical, uh, material where basically the zinc 4 O cluster is the, the building block and then a trifunctional linker is used to connect these zinc 4 O clusters and a bifunctional linker is used as a cross linker so you can also regard this as a crystalline copolymer in a sense which basically stabilizes this is a very rigid architecture basically that allows then to uh, sustain the stability during the adsorption. And at that time, these materials were very good in gas storage. For example, here you see a typical delivery co curve from uh, gas storage experiments. If you put such a MOF in a cylinder, the storage capacity is greatly enhanced by a factor of two to three, even at room temperature, um, because the the methane gas or the natural gas basically assumes a higher density state in the pore as compared to the um, pure gas in an empty tank. And this allows to enhance the storage capacity of these type of containers. And this is fully reversible, this type of behavior and was an important uh, industrial target at that time um, and also followed by um, BASF. So I was always annoyed because my students took so much time to measure isotherms. There was always a queue in front of the adsorption instrument. And uh, therefore, we also tried to develop some adsorption methodology, some instrument. This is the so-called InfraSorb technology developed in cooperation with Fraunhofer IWS. It's a very simple measurement, which uh, allows you to measure an adsorption experiment in five minutes. And uh, it is based on the heat of adsorption because whenever an adsorbent adsorbs a molecule, basically heat is released because adsorption is always exothermic. And uh, here you can use, for example, butane at room temperature, and you can measure the heat released not by a thermocouple, but by an optical sensor. This is an IR sensor. And this gives you basically a heat signal um, over the time. There's a, this is a uh, continuous measurement, a flow measurement. So there's also cooling involved and therefore the peak declines, but basically similar as a chromatogram the peak under the curve basically gives you an indication how much gas is adsorbed and uh, you can derive information about the adsorption capacity, the heat of adsorption, but also you see how rapid the adsorption takes place. You can get information about adsorption uh, kinetics and in some cases, even heat transfer. You can also use this for chemisorption to identify chemisorption sites, uh, ammonia or CO2 adsorption for ultra micropores. So it's a quite versatile um, technique. And to give you an example, this was a test measurement for uh, a, a test user. Here you see the temperature is quite stable. And once the material absorbs the gas, the temperature rises on the surface to 60 or 80 um, degrees centigrade. And then um, basically this was a real life measurement how you can detect uh, the absorption with this type of um, device. So having this in hand, it is possible to discover a lot of new materials and to screen them for a specific surface area and uh, high pore volume adsorption capacity. 
And of course, um, this does not help you in doing all the very systematic work in analyzing the structure of the metallogenic framework and um, recording isotherms in order to analyze carefully the adsorption uh, properties. And uh, over the many recent years, people have tried to improve and enhance the adsorption capacity of MOFs further and further. And these are just a few examples in this direction. For example, from Omayagi's group, the MOF 210, reaching uh, above 6,000 square meters per, per gram. Then the NU 110 from uh, Omar Faha and Joe Hub in Northwestern University, reaching over 7,000 square meters per gram. Then the DOT 49 from our group, reaching more than 5,000 uh, square meters per gram. And of course, some of the materials uh, from Ferre's group and some uh, other MOFs, some of the early MOFs in, um, in the field. And you see basically to achieve very high specific surface area, um, you can identify two principles here. One is um, making the linker longer and longer, making the struts thinner and thinner is uh, um, a strategy to achieve higher and higher surface area. Um, basically to have very thin struts that provide this high accessible um, surface area. But of course, this is also a very expensive uh, technology and also time consuming to make these very complex linkers. And another strategy that also comes up when you see these structures here without going too much in detail, you can identify already some structural stru uh, subunits, uh, which we call SBU, structural building blocks, building units. And in the MOF field, we call them metal organic polyhedra um, or MOPs. Uh, so you can connect MOPs in uh, three dimensional space to make MOFs. And uh, this is basically one of the strategies to achieve very high um, porosity in, in this field. So over the years, people have tried to push the BET surface area higher and higher. And this is the Chimborasco, uh, which was also um, studied by Alexander von Humboldt at a time when he was trying to climb higher and higher and to look at all the different zones and it becomes more and more difficult here in the cold zone to explore. And our expeditions nowadays are in the nanoscale regime and until 2012 the uh, NU110 was the world record in terms of specific surface area. So basically it had a surface area above 7,000 square meters per gram BT, apparent surface area reported. And in 2018, we reported a new material which we call DUT60, which has an even higher surface area, apparent BT surface area of 7,800 square meters uh, per, per gram. Now, uh, Omar Faha in his uh, Jack's paper pointed out that there may be a theoretical limit. Of course, this is imagination. Um, when we imagine a polyacetylene strut, which becomes longer and longer infinite uh, length, then we might achieve a specific surface area or a geometric surface area of almost 15,000 square meters per gram, which has not been achieved so far, of course. And uh, I think one of the reason, and this is what we basically pointed out in our publication in 2018, reporting this uh, ultra high porosity um, in, in this type of material here, 7,800 square meters per gram. Uh, one important point is of course, that the mechanical stability of these very thin and fragile networks, basically the mechanical stability becomes weaker and weaker. And um, therefore it is very challenging to maintain the porosity in these type of networks. So we calculated, and this is the strength of theory and in silico design, um, in this case uh, done by Jack Evans. Uh, so he calculated for this material, a bulk modulus of four, five uh, gigapascal, meaning the strength of the material. And uh, just to get an idea, DUT6 has already nine gigapascal, so factor of two higher and is quite rigid. So this becomes softer and softer. And uh, basically here we are approaching the bulk uh, modulus of a fluid. So you can imagine that this spider net becomes softer and softer. And this is actually the, the challenge in these type of materials to balance mechanical stability and ultra high uh, porosity. 
Uh, just to give an example, MOV399, which is a structure developed by Omar Yagi, has only a bulk modulus calculated of two gigapascal. And uh, it was never reported as a porous material. So there might be a, a limit between two and five gigapascal to, to reach these high specific surface areas. And uh, of course, another um, option to characterize it with, which is uh, also very appropriate, is the pore volume. The specific pore volume is five cubic centimeters per gram. This is uh, almost one order of magnitude higher as compared to a zeolite, which has typically about 0.5 cubic centimeters per gram. And of course, these ultra high porosities. So we proposed to talk about ultra high porosity above 5,000 square meters per gram, which is an arbitrary uh, value. But of course, these ultra high por uh, porosity values also uh, triggered a lot of uh, debate. Is it really true? 7,000 square meters per gram? Is it real? These questions always come up and are very important in the field of adsorption. So these are, of course, only BET surface areas, which are apparent BET surface areas. They have an effective value. And um, Roquerol um, proposed the consistency criteria to evaluate the BET surface area. And we tried to apply this also to the MOFs, but there are severe limitations, of course. So this value should not be seen as a geometric surface area. The geometric surface area can be calculated from the crystal structure. So uh, we call this the nitrogen accessible surface area. And here you see a comparison. The BT is 7,000 square meters per gram. The NASA, the nitrogen accessible surface area from the geometric model is only 6,000 square meters per gram. So there are dis huge discrepancies uh, between these uh, value. And Randy Snur pointed out, um, what are the reasons for this? That is basically that we have to um, yeah, simulate what is the true monolayer coverage, uh, essentially, in his paper. And so he developed a method to simulate the true monolayer coverage, which is normally derived from the BT uh, equation and from the isotherm. And this is another way, basically, to characterize the material, to give uh, um, an apparent um, surface area as the true monolayer um, coverage. However, these two models, the SNOR model and also here the simulation. Nowadays, we have computer programs like ZU++ or MUSIC that can calculate geometric surface areas. They only relate to the crystal structure and they don't relate to an experiment which gives, gives us information about the accessible surface area. Only the adsorption experiment gives us information about the accessible surface area or pore volume. So um, there's still a discrepancy and a lack of how we can extract um, geometric surface area or other surface areas from um, isotherms and um, probably an open debate we can uh, discuss forever, but it's also an interesting field to develop further. And with this, I'm coming to switchability. Switchability is most fascinating to me because it occurs also in nature to survive. And um, in, in this type of example, also living objects, we want to move, we want to react, uh, we react on stimuli. And um, uh, if you don't have a Venus flytrap in your garden, I also don't have one because it's a different climate, but I have this spring herb in my garden. It's very tedious because once you touch it, it expels the seed. So it's a very successful model, basically. And in the following, I will try to convince you that also this model, the flexibility, switchability, and uh, stimuli response is also very can be a very successful model for MOFs, or at least a very interesting one. So this is a MOF that we observed and we made, and it reacts to a stimuli basically by showing a huge volume expansion, uh, almost 240% volume expansion. The crystal here, when we uh, introduce a certain guest into the into the uh, moth, and um, with this, I would like to guide you into the field of uh, switchability. Um, some people also talk about flexibility, um, so we call this switchability, and I will explain in a minute why we call it like this. So, the first moth that was developed to be switchable is from Lee and Kaneko's work in 2001. They did not analyze the structure fully, 
but now we know that this material is called ELM11 for elastic layered material number 11. And it's a very simple coordination polymer, which has this four, four net uh, topology. So this is an infinite four, four net. And when you look from the side on this type of uh, network, you can see that this is a layered structure. So one layer and another layer here. And the uh, uh, green um, tetrahedron here is basically a BF4 minus anion, which is coordinated on top and on the bottom of the layer. And these um, basically BF4 minus anions are blocking the pores. So the this one is blocking the pore of the lower one here. So they are directed into the pores. And uh, with a gas molecule, CO2 or methane or butane, depending on the temperature, then the layers are expanded. And um, if uh, this structure looks a bit complicated, so there's a very simplified way to look at this. So we can see this, this is the square net here. And I draw the BF4 uh, minus anion just as a, a rod. And this rod basically is blocking the pore when the system is closed. And in the isotherm here from the original paper in 2001, we see that basically there's no adsorption up to a certain pressure 0.2. And at this pressure, suddenly the pore pops open and um, there's a significant, a very high uptake basically, and it continues like, like this. So um, you can imagine the switchability between these two states and this pressure where the um, structure starts to open is called the gate pressure. We call this a typical gating um, behavior. And this was the first example in the literature, despite some facts were not fully understand at that time, but now there's much more understood on this uh, model system, one of the early two-dimensional model systems in this um, field. Nowadays, there are many model systems known. Um, we um, yeah, have here basically the stacked layer system that I just described where the layers are separated from each other, similar to 2D structures. But then also nowadays we, we know 3D structures that can show swelling behavior, or so-called breathing behavior. And uh, in the breathing behavior, I will explain this in a minute. This is also a very typical case. We have a two-step transition from an open pore to a narrow pore form. And then again, from a narrow pore form to an open pore form with uh, increasing amount of gas. But there are many types of flexibility or switchability mechanisms that are recognized today. And there's uh, this also gives us a lot of uh, methods to tune this type of um, flexibility and pore size adaptability uh, in, in a way. So what is so special and why do I call this switchability? I think there is a quite a difference as compared to, let's say, um, polymers that also do swelling when you expose them to solvents um, like PMMA or whatever, um, because here we have a cooperative uh, switching mechanism. The metal organic framework has a crystal structure and it changes all unit cells in parallel. And this causes a stepwise switching from a closed pore phase, for example, in the case of the gate opening um, behavior to an open pore phase. And this is the most simple um, mechanism to go from a closed pore to an open pore phase. So one step switching, and this is what we call gate opening or gating behavior in this type of um, frameworks. And the other also um, quite frequently observed phenomenon is the breathing. Here, the open pore form is more stable without any guest. Here it is different. Here the closed pore form is more stable when the guest is uh, absent. So here the open pore form is more stable when the guest is absent. But once we introduce the guest, the network starts to shrink and it shows a stepwise transformation to a narrow pore form and again to an open pore form. And here the MIL, the MIL series from uh, Gérard Ferré is the most uh, prominent system showing this type of breathing, breathing behavior. And, um, and overall, this type of behavior and uh, mechanism led to a lot of new interesting phenomena in the field of adsorption, because now we couple 
phase transitions, crystalline uh, phase uh, transformations, basically two adsorption phenomena. And this was not known before, or only to a very little, little extent known before in the field of zeolites. Um, there's one special example, the silica light that shows a similar uh, behavior. So what is this good for? I don't know, but some people think it's very useful. And uh, for example, Kitagawa published in Science that some moths that show this switchability only switch their pores open for carbon monoxide, but not for nitrogen. Normally, carbon monoxide and nitrogen have very similar physical properties like the uh, critical temperature and so on and are difficult to separate. Uh, with fussy sorption. But here, he developed a moth that basically selectively opens the pore for carbon monoxide. And this is sort of the dream in the field, a moth that basically recognizes which molecule is coming. And when the molecule is coming that it wants, then it opens the pore for that specific molecule. And of course, the dream for the moth scientist is to design this type of material to predict this interaction that selectively opens the pores. And then we can think of other applications like Bang Lin Chen published in 2017, a very effective propine propene separation based on this principle. Only one species, the propine, is adsorbed here selectively. Or sensing, we can think of a change of physical uh, property, magnetism, optical properties with the switching. And we observe this quite frequently. And we can think of uh, selective sensing, recognizing molecules. And uh, Hong Kai Zhou even published a switchable catalyst in 2016, meaning that the catalyst can be switched on and off with this switchability mechanism. But besides these applications, it's also fundamentally quite interesting and um, fascinating um, to me. So in my view, it's very in important before we roll this out to BASF or companies to get a better understanding of these flexibility and switchability phenomena. In the past, many people were frustrated because a moth reacted somehow and they didn't understand it. And I think our role is also to analyze and get a better understanding to develop this platform of material for the industry or for applications or for functions. And uh, an enabling tool to get uh, to shine light on the transformations on these type of uh, switchability mechanisms is we have to develop tools and eyes that can watch the moth while it's doing these structural transformations. And therefore, I would like to briefly highlight some of the most important techniques that we are also developing, but also other groups have been developing. We are not the first to do this. For example, diffraction gives very important information on the long range order in crystalline materials. We can also, at the synchrotron, we can also do X-ray absorption, with, which gives information about the local structure of the metal, if there are some changes in the cluster, for example. I will not go into UV Vis and Raman, but I will also introduce or explain some details uh, what we can do with NMR spectroscopy if we connect a dosing system basically to a static uh, NMR where the sample is located in a high pressure cylinder that can be analyzed with NMR or with EPR, um, electron paramagnetic uh, resonance, um, while the NMR basically looks at the gas species. Um, carbon-13 NMR can look at CO2 and methane. The EPR can look at radicals and uh, all the metals or many metals uh, have paramagnetic centers in the pedal wheel or in other centers. And this can be used to, to follow the transitions and the structural changes in situ. And, uh, um, and this is some of the tools. So as I said, we were not the first to do this, but in 2014, we re reported a new system, which I will just briefly explain as a, an example. There's uh, also reviews in this field. Um, we also published a review recently on in situ technologies um, for other people's work. But here, the key in this technology is basically that um, we can measure a full isotherm on our sample. The sample is located here inside a beryllium dome covered chamber. And um, this is basically our 
uh, volumetric cell that we normally use in the uh, adsorption experiment. So this is our volumetric uh, receiver where the sample is located. You can also put some excess of the sample in this reservoir. And here the sample can be put into the synchrotron beam. And in this way, you can analyze diffraction patterns and follow the transitions in, in situ. So uh, we connect this to a volumetric adsorption instrument, such as the Bell's of Max, for example. And uh, the synchrotron gives it, uh, or the Bell's of Max gives, gives a trigger to the synchrotron when the sample is equilibrated. And then we can measure an X ray diffraction pattern in parallel to analyzing the full adsorption isotherm. And what is special about this device is basically that there is a second beryllium dome on top in order to evacuate the space in between the um, gas chamber and the uh, outer um, uh, environment in order to achieve a very good thermal equilibration because uh, of course we don't want to have any leakage here and we we this is also different from normal x-ray diffraction in situ x-ray or operando catalysis measurements here in order to have really full equilibrium we need to have a high uh, thermal stability for this type of instrumentation to measure isotherms at 77 kelvin so um, just a few examples here in this field. One of the model systems we have been investigating for many years <clears throat> is this uh, pillared layer MOF, which we call DUT8. So um, it has basically a square net architecture and the nodes here are paddle wheel clusters. So this is what we call paddle wheel cluster with four naphthalene dicarboxylates linked to the paddle wheel. And Hence, you form a 4-4 net, similar as you form basically when you uh, make a building, you make your um, uh, different uh, stories basically by having a grid and then you need a pillar and the pillar in this case is a simple so-called DAPCO ligand, an NN donor ligand that basically pillars the layer. And this material shows a huge volume change, a typical prototypical gating behavior, one step gate opening and at 0.1 in P over P0 in nitrogen adsorption, it basically opens the pore. And you can even see the volume expansion here very nicely in a syringe um, going from 0.1 milliliter to 0.2 um, milliliter. So you can even uh, optically visualize this transition. So this is one example for in situ diffraction. You see the powder patterns here developing for just one example, ethane adsorption. This is the boiling point of ethane here. And you see that basically here, one powder pattern changes at 0.3. You see a new powder pattern developing and at 0.8 in P over P0, there's a new powder pattern developing. And you can analyze all the X-ray diffraction patterns by Rietveld refinement or simulation and find out what is the structure uh, transformation. And what you recognize here is that in this case, here this is the ideal pedal wheel, and this is the highly distorted pedal wheel in the closed pore phase. So here the pedal wheel is the hinge. So that's the flexibility mode. The, the pedal wheel acts as the hinge in this type of transformation. And here we have a two-step gate opening basically, and the hinge is uh, slightly opening up. And this is um, then shows you very easily or uh, makes you rationalize, how can I tune the behavior of this type of material? I need to tune the hinge and the hinge energetics can be tuned by um, changing the pedal wheel composition. For example, by introducing other metals. Um, the original MOF that we developed was a nickel MOF uh, with the nickel pedal wheel. And um, we have now all the other metals of course, and um, I would like to highlight the behavior of the cobalt um, system, a work uh, recently published by Sebastian Erling, one of my PhD students. And what is fascinating to me is that here we exactly see this selectivity behavior. So the DUT8 nickel, for example, when we look at the adsorption isotherms for uh, chlorinated uh, methane, dichloromethane, trichloromethane, tetrachloromethane, they all look more or less the same. It's just a bit boring. But it's completely different for the cobalt system. So um, trichloro and tetrachloromethane, they cannot open the pore, but the dichloromethane, it opens the pore and we have a huge uh, adsorption capacity. 
And this shows that we can tune the selectivity by tuning the energetics of the hinge. And this is one way, one initial understanding um, how we can tune the properties of these type of materials. Again, here in situ, diffraction is very powerful. And we have recently, this is not published yet, developed a system where you can uh, measure uh, vapor phase adsorption um, with a normal volumetric vapor phase adsorption system. And we have developed an in situ chamber to measure uh, vapors at the synchrotron, which can operate at these temperatures and pressures indicated here. And um, uh, I just show you basically along the adsorption branch. Here we see the gate opening. This is for the nickel system for uh, dichloromethane. This is the isotherm that we measured. And you see a clear gate opening at a pressure of uh, 0.5 in P over P0. And here you see how the powder patterns uh, develop. You can see basically the new OP phase um, starting to appear here. Here we have a mixture of OP and CP phase and then the pure OP phase at these uh, higher um, vapor pressures in P over P0. So this is an enabling technique. You can uh, use diffraction for vapors and uh, and gases. And here, the speciality is that we can also measure a full isotherm at the same time. So um, diffraction gives uh, information about the long range order, but not about the local structure or defects or uh, other details. And therefore, uh, in cooperation with the Pepple group, we have also started to develop in situ EPR spectroscopy. This is electron paramagnetic res resonance spectroscopy. And I cannot go into all the details here, of course, but it's a probe spectroscopy that allows you to detect radicals. And as I said, metals are often radicals. They have one or more um, um, uh, spins, uh, uh, configurations, um, um, single electrons, basically, that can be detected uh, here in, in this way. Unpaired electrons, that was the term I was looking for. Sorry for that. And uh, what we have to do is basically the same as before. We have to develop a dosing system that allows us to um, measure or to dose a certain pressure to the EPR tube. And we have to develop an adapter. And then we can put the tube into the um, cavity of the, here it's an X-band uh, EPR spectrometer. And uh, EPR spectroscopy is very valuable because it covers a wide range of temperatures. And with this dosing system, we can cover a wide range of pressures. And I would also like to point out that the group of uh, Fedin in uh, Novosibirsk is also one of the pioneers in this field. So both these authors are certainly the high, highly recognized experts in this field. So Without going too much in detail, what we can do with this, um, we have to install a probe. And uh, so it's nice for a cooperation between synthesis and, and uh, um, physical detection, because we need to make a tailored material that basically substitutes a probe uh, into the pedal wheel. And here we have done this with Cobalt. Cobalt 2 plus has a spin um, of three half normally. So three unpaired electrons, but here it couples with a nickel, which has two unpaired electrons. And this is our interpretation why we have uh, in total a coupled system of spin half. But if, you, if we just want to make it easy, just think there is the cobalt introduces basically an unpaired electron. There's a rough picture and this allows us to detect a signal. And uh, the cobalt also has a nuclear um, spin which is seven half and therefore due to the hyperfine coupling, we find a very complex multiplet uh, spectrum here basically, which is characteristic for the OP form. And now we can do, this is for example, nitrogen adsorption at 71 Kelvin, a little bit below the boiling point of uh, nitrogen. And uh, what we see is that in the highly contracted hinged pedal wheel, this um, species is EPR silent. This is difficult to explain, but it has something to do with the distortion and we don't see a signal. But once it opens up, the signal becomes apparent and we can integrate the signal. 
and basically pot, plot the integral versus the pressure. And this is what you see here. And you see that basically similar as what we've seen before at about point one in P over P zero, the network opens up and, um, and we see basically the OP, the signal for the OP stretched uh, cluster. And then in the desorption, you see the hysteresis as you see for the nitrogen adsorption isotherm. And then you see also the, the closing here. So this is a very nice technique that gives a local picture, a local probe for the framework, for the structural transformations, um, looking at the framework um, structural changes. But I would also like to address how we can get some more information about the species inside uh, the framework, the guest species like methane or CO2 for people who are interested in the separation. And uh, before I do this, I would like to briefly um, remind you to one aspect that is also still one of the open questions in the field, that is the impact of crystal size. From an empirical point of view, it has been shown and several uh, publications, for example, by Kitagawa in Science 2013, but then also uh, very excellent work by Ryan Lively and also by uh, Watanabe in uh, Kyoto, Ryan Lively in the US. Um, it has been shown that crystal size has a pronounced impact on switchability and uh, adsorption isotherms. And Again, we study this model material here, which we call DOT8. And uh, we observe here basically that the dissolvation of the network, if the particles are below 500 nanometer, um, the uh, network does not form the contracted phase, the CP phase. Only if the crystals are larger than one micron, the crystals transform into the CP phase. So there's a pronounced effect on crystallite size on switch, uh, switchability. And so this network here remains rigid, despite it has the same composition, chemical composition, as the large particles here. And this we call switchable. And in a minute or in a second here, you can see that there are pronounced significant um, influences on the adsorption behavior. The rigid one shows a typical type one behavior no switchability, no gating, no switching. And the switchable variant with the same chemical composition, but only larger crystals shows the switchability. So it switches open here in nitrogen adsorption um, at about 0.1 in P over P0. So there are still uh, open questions in this field why this is the case, but uh, it is. I, I just take this here now as an empirical observation. But this is also great prerequisite in order to study the fundamentals, the impact of switchability, because now we can compare guest adsorption selectivity for rigid and switchable variants with the same framework chemistry, this, the same framework composition without altering the linker or the metal or something like this. And to get fundamental insights, it's uh, very interesting. And uh, for example, looking at selective uh, gas adsorption in CO2 methane, many people are interested to separate CO2 from methane uh, for obvious reason, because they want to use the methane or from biogases, they have, there's a lot of CO2 and we need to separate it. And of course there's in a rigid moth, there's also selectivity because the interaction with the CO2 is stronger. There's a higher adsorption enthalpy as compared to the methane uh, of course, the boiling points are also uh, different. The critical characteristics are different. So um, this MOF has already in the rigid form a high selectivity for the adsorption of CO2. But no matter which pressure you look at, it also adsorbs uh, methane. And the selectivity will always be limited by the amount of methane that is co-adsorbed. Of course, these are single component adsorption isotherms. This behavior is totally different when you look at a flexible variant, the flexible DOT8 nickel. Here you see, when you look at the methane adsorption isotherm, the methane cannot open the pore. So there's no methane adsorbed. Only CO2 can adsorb inside the pore and can open the framework. And of course, this 
in theory should give an infinite uh, selectivity. Great. But of course, you are clever. And what you would say is, yes, but once the CO2 opens the pore, the methane should also be absorbed because the pores are open and what happens. And therefore, we are asking the question, is this really the case and how we can understand this and, um, and, and measure this? And for this, we used uh, recently the in situ NMR spectroscopy um, using carbon 13 NMR. And uh, this is uh, maybe a bit brief without too much introduction, but uh, what we are basically doing, we are dosing CO2 and methane into the capillary. It's a sapphire capillary where the moth is located. And we are measuring the signal of the CO2 and of the methane in the cylinder. And uh, what is interesting in this case is basically that um, you can uh, see the, the CO2 and methane in the gas phase. This is this very sharp signal here. Um, actually here the pressure is uh, recorded here. So this is the blue is adsorption and the red is desorption. So you can see the, um, the free gas, which is uh, not in the MOF as a very uh, narrow signal. And then you can also see the adsorbed uh, molecules. And in this case, we know from other experiments that the uh, adsorbed CO2 shows a very broad signal. This is due to the anisotropy of the MOF. Um, it's uh, because it's uh, not rotating uh, the, the measurement here. It's a static NMR measurement. And uh, basically, there is a preferred orientation of or limited mobility of the CO2 inside the pore. Uh, there's a we can recognize this as a preferred orientation, um, the adsorbed state in this case. And therefore, we observe a broad chemical range shift, which is also um, called a tensorial property because it's associated to the tensor of this orientation, basically. And this broad signal basically is getting stronger and stronger. Here you see the adsorbed CO2. It's getting stronger and stronger. And um, then you see also once we desorb it, it's, it's also then at a certain point lost again. And this allows you to integrate the signal and basically to measure the adsorption of CO2 in situ with the NMR spectroscopy. And you get a very similar gating behavior in the mixture. And uh, we also know where the adsorbed methane would be located. And uh, in this case, you have to believe me that the adsorbed methane would be um, observed here very close to the uh, isotropic signal. And in this case, we can show that there's no methane adsorbed, at least um, in the limits of the method, the NMR spectroscopy, the sensitivity is not ultra high, um, but it is a, a very good uh, measure. So this is a fundamental proof of concept showing that um, in the switching MOFs, there's a very strong trend that if one species open the pores, the other does not get access. And um, it is still an open question why this is the case, but our interpretation is that there are restoring forces that still press on the CO2, basically. This is also the reason why we get this high anisotropy. And uh, we think that this is the reason for this very high degree of, of selectivity. Okay, so, um, I don't have a conclusion for the first part, but I wanted to guide you into the field of uh, metal organic frameworks with ultra high porosity and also um, switchability and the in situ methods. I see that I've already <laughs> taken 50 minutes for this first um, part. So uh, I think I should now take some questions and maybe we can have a Q and A session to have a break. break. Um, Yes, uh, so we have two questions from YouTube. Um, Arash Deep Sig asks how selective sensing happens and which factors are responsible uh, for this effect, uh, for example, for carbon monoxide or nitrogen. Um, so the in the case I've uh, shown in this example, basically, the selectivity is uh, very high. I forgot the, the factor, it's over 100, uh, but it has not been used for the sensing in this case. So 
Here it has been used for the separation of CO and, and nitrogen. And the mechanism is here basically that the, um, there's a copper center and the carbon coordinates to the copper um, from the CO molecule because CO is a donor also, while nitrogen is not, and two is a very weak uh, donor. And due to the coordination, the channel changes its structure and opens up the, the MOF. So in this case, this has not been used for sensing uh, applications, as far as I know, only for the separation. And the separation factor was above 100. Um, yeah. But I would like to direct you or recommend also to read the most recent work by Matsuda, Rio, Riato Matsuda, uh, and cooperation partners who are still working on these type of systems um, also for room temperature separations, which is a very interesting and excellent uh, work. And um, yes, that's that's what I can say. Okay, thank you. The second question is from Anaga Bhattacharya. What is the heat of adsorption for these materials? Um, and how do they compare to non-switchable adsorbents? Um, I come to this point a little bit in my second presentation, but um, the heat of adsorptions are not in particular special. Um, in fact, the, the fact that we can have a rigid, well, maybe I pass to this slide here, we have um, a material which is a model material which we can synthesize as a rigid and as a switchable material. And this allows us to measure the heats of adsorption for the rigid variant with the same chemistry basically and compare it to the um, switchable adsorbent. And the adsorption entropies for the rigid variant are very similar to normal MOFs. Uh, so between 10 and 40 kilojoule per mole. So exothermic of course, but what we have to say is that the, trans the structural transformation requires also a heat of transformation and um, the adsorption entropy has to compensate that transformation energy that is required. And therefore, when you measure the uh, heat of adsorption at the step where the transformation happens, basically you will see that the heat of adsorption and the heat of transformation start to balance each other. So they come to a point where they are um, closer to zero, let's say like this. Okay, thank you. And that is another one for, from Joao Marieros. In the joint uh, adsorption and MR study, how do you know that methane is not absorbing strongly on the cluster or linker and relaxing too fast to be detected by an MR? It could actually be absorbed. Could it actually be absorbed? Yes. Uh, so we measured uh, the rigid variant also, and we detected the methane also in the rigid uh, structure. Unfortunately, I don't have the, the slide here, but um, the signal of the adsorbed methane is um, a little bit aside from the isotropic signal and uh, therefore we know where we can detect it. And uh, therefore we are quite convinced that um, it is at least below the uh, limit of detectability by NMR um, methods. Okay, thank you. Um, and there's another one from Hanan Tesel. Do you think the selectivity of CO2 and uh, CO would work like for nitrogen and carbon monoxide in the MOF? Uh, maybe I don't fully understand the question. So, uh, so this example here from the Kitagawa group is basically an example where nitrogen is separated from CO. So I would like to refer you to this publication here. Um, it's a low temperature CO nitrogen separation, which is reported here, where only the CO is adsorbed. Did I get this question? Maybe I didn't get the question quite right. Mm, yeah, sorry, I don't know either. Yeah, okay. No <laughs> okay, you have time for two more? Yes. Or shall we put them to the end? Okay, then there's one from Stefano Canossa. 
as we also saw in the presentation, switch switchability can damage MOF architectures by breaking crystals or creating connection defaults between building blocks. Can you comment on what is known concerning the occurrences of the usage induced damage and what is more needed to be understood? Yes, so um, from from what, what I think is in the, the current state of the art uh, present, we can say that um, the larger the volume change in the crystal, the higher is the stress and this induces the cracking of the crystal and fractionation, which does not mean that the moth is destroyed, but it just means that um, the crystals um, are fractionated into a domain structure. Uh, we also reported a paper on this comparing three or four different archetypical MOFs with 100 cycles. And um, for example, MIL-53, which has a, um, a lower volume change, can be cycled many, many times without cracking, while um, other MOFs, which have a huge volume change, they can show the, the cracking. Um, but I agree that there are also some open questions to how to avoid the, the cracking. Um, but uh, I, I would say the, the volume change in the crystal at the um, and the, the crystal size is, is the, are the most important factors that uh, basically determine the, what we call fatigue uh, in, in this type of field. Okay, thanks. And the last round one uh, is from Rafael Balderas. In the experiment of in situ NMR for carbon dioxide and my, uh, methane in DOT8, um, is there a specific reason why you use a two to one mixture, not a one to one mixture? Uh, no, there's uh, no reason in this case. Uh, I have to admit that this is also a quite expensive and, and long experiment. And uh, we just started with this mixture two to one, basically. So, uh, it's certainly a good idea to, we are also still in the process of investigating this further in terms of temperature, pressure, gas mixtures, and so on. Thank good you. Point. Then yeah. I will uh, forward the other questions at the end of your lecture. Okay, great. Then I come to the second part. Okay. Yes. Okay, great. Can you see my slides? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Then please stay tuned. I, I come to the second part of my presentation. And uh, here I mainly want to guide you into the field, which is a little bit my, you, in Germany we say spleen, the counterintuitive absorption phenomena. So in 2016, we discovered a very strange phenomenon, which I would like to introduce here, uh, which we call now negative gas absorption. And um, I we we'll try to explain what we have learned over the last years um, by applying this portfolio of in situ techniques, uh, in situ X-ray diffraction, neutron diffraction, and so on. And I will also explain another technique that I've not uh, explained yet, which is um, the xenon NMR, which can also gives you, give you some interesting information about the structural changes. And I will briefly explain what we know so far in terms of design criteria, making materials that show this counterintuitive uh, behavior. And uh, probably I will not go to the temperature dependence and, and then I will give an outlook at the end for my whole presentation. So the only thing you need to understand for the following is the structure of a MOF, which we call DUT49. It consists of this carbazole type dicarboxylate. It also forms pedal wheels. And these pedal wheels, basically six of these pedal wheels are connected with 12 carbazole dicarboxylates to form these MOPs, which I've explained briefly in the beginning of my presentation, which we call MOP, MOP. And uh, if you can connect these metal organic polyhedra via the nitrogen, so with this uh, atom here, you have a platform of materials that you can tune basically. So we connect these metal organic polyhedra in three dimensional space. And this is what we call DUT 49. So when you can just a simplified view on this is to look only where's the nitrogen in this polyhedron. We have 12 nitrogen. So it's a metal organic cube octahedron 
uh, with 12 um, corners, basically. And um, this is a very common motif also that you know from freshman chemistry. You connect 12 spheres with each other um, because this is basically what happens in the copper structure of the copper metal where you have a cubic closed packing. This is freshman chemistry. Um, this is called the CCP packing, the cubic closed sphere packing. And essentially here you have MOPS packing uh, in, in a CCP fashion. And the students in the first semester, we teach them that this is an ABC uh, packing basically. And, but what is interesting, um, when you connect these spheres, so in the metal, of course, these are just atoms, but here we connect these MOPs with the uh, biphenyl linkers, for example. And uh, then we create the voids in between the, the spheres, like in the CCP packing. So there are tetrahedral voids that you can see here. And there are also octahedral voids that you can see here from the ABC packing in between the, the layers, basically. So each um, MOP is surrounded by six MOPs in one layer and three above and three below. And in between, we have the tetrahedral and octahedral um, voids. But as compared to a normal copper metal structure, here um, the spacing is much larger and the voids are much larger. So they are, this is a crystal structure, um, single crystal structure, and the voids are 2.4 nanometer, 24 angstrom. This is the largest pore, the octahedral void, and this gives us this um, huge pore volume and high specific surface area, ultra high um, surface area, as I've pointed out in the um, beginning. So initially we invented this material for our gas storage studies. So this is a high pressure uh, gas storage experiment up to 140 bar. And this has a, was the record, the world record in 2002 in terms of gravimetric gas storage capacity up to 540 milligram per gram storage capacity at room temperature. And um, at that time, we became more interested in studying the fundamentals and why this MOF is so special and has such a high capacity for, for methane storage. And therefore, we did something which is maybe not so standard. We went to the boiling point of methane, which is um, 111 Kelvin and recorded a normal isotherm like you would do for, for nitrogen. And we found a very strange behavior. So this material has a kink in the adsorption branch. And uh, basically you adsorb some gas and then suddenly there is a step here and a plateau. And this step here, you can think, oh, maybe it's just an artifact, but it's quite high. And uh, of course, in the beginning I said, okay, this, this cannot be this, uh, negative adsorption is physically unreasonable. Maybe the cryostat had some problems and so on. But, uh, but in, the, in the end, um, my students measured this over and over and it was fully reproducible. We measured it on a Bell instrument, on a quantachrome instrument, uh, on a rubotherm balance, uh, many instruments, and it was always reproducible. So there is a desorption step in the adsorption branch. Um, which is 160 cubic centimeters per gram. This is more than some zeolites can even take up and uh, it's quite significant step. And then there's this strange isotherm behavior. There's a huge uptake again here. This is 70 millimole. This is a huge uptake. And uh, then there is this strange hysteresis. So at that time we didn't un really understand that. And, uh, but my student uh, had a, a clever idea. So first of all, methane at 111 Kelvin is quite exotic, but um, first of all, we found that this behavior can be also seen at room temperature with other gases. For example, butane has a higher heat of adsorption and it shows a similar behavior at room temperature. And uh, it also has a kink here in the isotherm and then a plateau. And my student, Simon Krause, he had the idea um, to film the sample during the uh, measurement. And here you can basically see what's going on uh, when you approach this negative gas adsorption step. You can see that gas is coming out of the sample because that's what it means. Um, you get a desorption, there's a kink, uh, a negative uh, step. It means that gas is adsorbed. When you increase the pressure, the gas is coming out of the sample. It's moving up the sample. And then after the step, oh, 
oh, it's moving down. So there's a huge volume change. Um, it's it's contracting the sample, and this is only the powder in the in the apparatus uh, basically, and it already tells you that there must be huge structural changes. This is already an optical indication for dynamics and dynamic in in MOFs and porous materials. So as we have this enabling technique, the in situ X-ray diffraction, um, then uh, we followed this kink basically with our isotherm measurements. And initially we have a huge uh, unit cell with 100,000 cubic angstrom and a huge pore volume. And what we found is that after this step, there's a significant transformation. So all the peaks are moving to higher angles, meaning that there's a contraction and um, the cell volume of the uh, unit cell is contracting by more than 50%. So 47,000 cubic angstrom in this intermediate phase, we call this the contracted phase now. And we also do all the wheat felt refinement basically. And uh, we see that this huge octahedral pore in the center is contracted to a micro pore of less than one nanometer. And what happens at, at higher pressure is that the moth is reopening again and we see almost the original structure again, almost 100,000 cubic angstrom, and the pore is completely restored. So this is a breathing moth. You can see this in the following animation, basically, that in the intermediate phase contracts the mesopore of 2.4 nanometer. This is this orange pore here to a micropore of less than one nanometer, 0.9 nanometer. And, um, and then it reopens again at, at higher pressure. It's a breathing mesoporous moth essentially. And the reason for the negative gas absorption is basically that in this contraction, this spontaneous contraction, the gas, the methane is pushed out and uh, expelled basically to the cell and causing a pressure um, amplification. So what's the mechanism behind? And this comes a little bit also to the question of the adsorption entropy. And here, the power of silicon technology and in silico um, prediction and design is, is very important. Uh, for example, here by the uh, work by Jack Evans and FX Crudea in 2016, these materials have a typical bistable behavior. They have a global minimum. This is the cell volume at the large open cell in the OP structure when there's no guest, uh, meaning that this stretched form of the linker is the thermodynamically stable form. And um, But there's also a local minimum when you compress them, when the linker is buckled. It's basically the compressed or tilted form of the, the linker here in this case, which is but energetically much higher. So here they calculated 1000 kilojoule per mole per, per unit cell. So this is the bistable profile and this is typical and a prerequisite for this type of um, behavior. Now, what happens when the gas is present? The gas basically compensates that. And uh, Jack Evans calculated these bistable profiles for various gas loadings. And what you see is that in um, with zero loading, the OP phase is the more stable one. But once you reach an intermediate loading, then the CP phase becomes the more stable one. So this local um, minimum becomes the global minimum in this case. And then at higher loading, again, the OP phase becomes the thermodynamically more stable phase. So at full loading, the OP phase becomes the more stable phase. And the reason for this behavior are the stark differences in adsorption enthalpy for the OP and the CP form. Because in the OP phase, you have a low adsorption enthalpy, and in the narrow pore or CP contracted pore phase, you have a high adsorption enthalpy in terms of magnitude. And um, due to the great cooperation with Philippe Llewellyn and Paul Yacomi in Marseille, we were also able to measure experimentally these adsorption enthalpies for the OP and for the CP phase. And we find an average an adsorption enthalpy here in this relevant range, which is about 10 kilojoule per mole for the OP phase and about 17 kilojoule per mole for the CP phase. So much, much higher in uh, magnitude. And basically it means that due to the energetic preference of the methane molecules for the CP phase, they contract uh, 
the structure at intermediate loading and only at high loading, basically um, due to the higher capacity of the OP phase, the total amount uh, multiplied with the adsorption enthalpy then leads to the um, reopening. So that's the mechanism behind for the um, contraction. Still, it is difficult to understand why there is this negative kink. And um, from the thermodynamic point of view, it's forbidden. That means that this uh, state here is not a thermodynamically stable state. It's a, a metastable, long-lived uh, state, similar to um, hysteresis behavior in MCM41, basically, where there's also hysteresis between adsorption and desorption branch. So shortly before the mesopores we start uh, filling, we have a metastable state, and then we have a sudden contraction, and that basically pushes the, the gas uh, out. So in order to understand and prove that this pore filling mechanism is responsible, um, we went into in situ neutron diffraction analysis. And uh, neutron diffraction is in particular valuable to locate the gas molecules inside the pores. And we have done um, CD4 adsorption at the same temperature. So we, in the neutron diffraction, we have to substitute the hydrogen by deuterons, but the physical properties are quite similar for the CD4. And then we can locate these molecules inside the pores. These are the experimental patterns, which I don't want to describe in detail. But what is shown here is basically the degree of filling with respect to the pressure um, of the smallest pore, which is the MOP, the MOP, and then the tetrahedral pore and the large octahedral pore. And what we can recognize here is that the MOP is basically completely filled when we have the before we have the contraction, but uh, in particular, the tetrahedral and at mostly the octahedral pore, the mesopore, starts to be filled shortly be before the contraction. And we think that this is an important point that um, is responsible for this type of um, behavior. And of course, because we are synthesis uh, people, we are trying to prove this by synthesizing new and better um, model materials. And uh, here's a visualization of this type of pore filling behavior. So you can see first the MOPs are completely filled. And then at the last, basically the octahedral pores are filled. And uh, this is um, the, the pore filling uh, mechanism. So this is one way to look at the positions of the methane molecules inside the pore. But there's also another very powerful but highly exotic technique that can be used, but it's not so difficult to uh, to do it. It's the xenon NMR. And uh, because it was very late yesterday evening, um, I tried to, uh, to make this funny picture here, which uh, basically um, resembles that xenon can be the eye of the poor enthusiast. And the xenon atom is sort of the eye that travels to the pore and tells the xenon, uh, tells the um, porous material people how large is the pore and what are the properties of the pore wall. Because the chemical shift of the xenon NMR probe also depends on the pore wall interactions. Um, this is basically this term delta S here in this equation. Delta is the chemical shift. And then it also depends on the xenon xenon interactions. And they are, of course, dependent on the um, on the amount of molecules that uh, uh, atoms that interact and also of the and also the density of the xenon plays a role here and um, these also determine so the ultimately the chemical shift is also then uh, pressure dependence i don't want to um, go too much into the theory of equations there's a nice book by my colleague Eike Brunner and the pioneer in this field is uh, Professor Fressar, who also contributed the first chapter in this uh, book. And I just want to give you a few examples how we can use the xenon NMR uh, to analyze the flexibility and, and structural changes in, in MOFs. But before we do this, it's important to understand what xenon NMR looks like for rigid materials. And a very nice model uh, system in this case is the UIO66 which is a very stable and rigid system. The 66 has the fennel linker, the 67 has the bifennel linker. So we see the impact of the pore size in this system. And here, this is a typical 
Xenon NMR spec, these are typical Xenon NMR spectra with respect to P over P0. So at P over P01, we see the liquid Xenon, um, which has a chemical shift of about 200 ppm. In this isotherm, this is shown here as liquid xenon with 200 ppm. And then we see that basically with increased filling, the um, chemical shift of the xenon shifts to higher uh, values. And for the UIO67, this is this curve here. And we see basically we can call this maybe a type 1 or type 1b um, isotherm that we see here for this type of um, pore system. What is quite funny, I mean, this looks like a normal isotherm where you put the uptake here. Uh, but it, this is not the case. This is not the uptake, it's just the chemical shift. So the chemical shift resembles here basically the adsorption behavior um, very well. And you can already see the impact of the pore size because in the UIO66, you have the smaller pore size. And therefore, um, the chemical shift in general is further away from the pure liquid behavior. So if you if you have a huge pore where basically the atom only sees other atoms, then it would basically be closer to the liquid xenon behavior. And once you have more surface interactions, you're moving up here and you're showing a, a different chemical shift, And but you also have the pressure dependence. So this is the rigid uh, material. And uh, I will show this now also for our DOT49, which is the flexible material. And um, here I show a case where there is no structural change because the structural change is also temperature dependent. Above a critical temperature, which I've just uh, mentioned as T flex here in, in, this, uh, um, in this slide, above this temperature at warm temperature, basically there is no structural transformation with xenon. And we see a similar type one or type one B uh, adsorption isotherm. Here again, this is the chemical shift because the xenon is so fast traveling in between the pores that we cannot distinguish if it is in the large pore or in the small pore. But once we approach the um, highest filling, the chemical shift is very close to the liquid xenon in, in this case, basically. So of course, due to the surface interaction, it, there's a deviation. But now comes the interesting point. Once we go below the flexibility temperature. So at the temperature where the system becomes flexible, we can watch with the xenon basically, with the xenon NMR, how the structural transformation takes place. So we see initially at low pressure, the chemical shift is at this uh, position here. And then once we increase the pressure and we have the structural transformation, there's a huge shift of the chemical signal because suddenly we move to a, from a mesoporous to a microporous system. And then due to the pressure change, the signal is shifting. And here we can even see two signals um, because we have a coexistence of the OP and the CP phase. And then at high pressure, the system is completely open and we only have the open pore phase. And in this diagram, we see the volumetric xenon adsorption isotherm with this strange kink and the breathing behavior. Here we have the transition to the CP phase. So here we go from the OP phase to the CP phase. We have a huge change. Then we go in adsorption to higher pressure. Here we have the coexistence of the CP and the OP phase. And we can even follow um, the development of two peaks um, separately. So that's why I'm convinced that the xenon is a great eye for the poor enthusiast and the people investigating the poor systems, because there's a lot of uh, things we can learn from, from that and uh, get sort of some, some insights here. So as I said, in order to get a better understanding of these type of systems, of course, the question is, what can we do um, to, to rationally make new systems that also show this counterintuitive behavior, a material that basically expulses gas while you increase the pressure. This is quite counterintuitive. And um, therefore, we have tried to develop some design principles for new NGA materials by rationalizing the internal stress that is responsible for the transformation. And here we have basically this buckling behavior which in the linker looks like this. So we go from a straight form to a buckled uh, form, quite twisted form. And uh, 
Jack Evans basically developed a model here, which relates to the Euler's law of the critical load. It's basically in buildings when you have two stories and you have a column in between, it basically gives you um, the estimation of a critical pressure that is needed to buckle the column. And this uh, buckling behavior of the column depends on the various constants here, elastic modulus and so on. But it also, and I would only like to point out today, it also depends on the column length. And um, this is a, a critical um, aspect here. So this is where the synthesis chemist can do something. We can change the length of the column by just making longer linkers. And Simon Krause in his uh, PhD studied this behavior from a very short linker to a very long linker. And these are the the labels of these type of materials. And you can see these are the uh, predicted and some of them are also uh, single crystal structures basically that we have received here. And you see that the pore is going bigger and bigger. And with this type of isoreticular series, we can understand what is the impact of the, the column length. So this again shows the potential of in silico design. Sim um, Jack Evans, calculated all the energy profiles for these type of materials and all of them show a bistable profile. Here the green curve is always the curve for the original material DUT49 <clears throat> and um, uh, it is compared here and we see that the main differences between the different uh, um, elongated linkers are basically in the difference of the free energy be between the global and the local minimum. So this is getting closer and closer this is an important point. And another important point is also that the volume change between the CP and the OP form is um, yeah, systematically changing uh, here. And experimentally is what we find here that uh, basically there is a critical length needed to induce the buckling. So the shorter linkers 48 and 46, they don't lead to a buckling in methane adsorption at 111 Kelvin. Only starting from DUT49, we realize the buckling and the NGA and the compression. And the new material that we published last year, DUT50 also shows the NGA effect. Please also notice this is a huge experimental uptake here. More than 80 millimole per gram methane is a, it's a great capacity. And um, unfortunately, we were not able to make the DUT 151 um, as the open pore form because it forms an interpenetrated form. So here the behavior is more complicated. But from this, we can predict and we can deduce new criteria. And um, so there is a critical length needed basically to be able to buckle, to compensate this, uh, the, the energetic transformation, the delta F and, uh, and uh, also there's a critical volume difference needed between these two forms in order to achieve the, the NGA. So with this, uh, I conclude my presentation on the counterintuitive uh, behavior. I would like to point out again why this is counterintuitive. Um, because when you have a negative step in the adsorption branch, it means basically you press the gas pressure to the sample, nor a normal MOF would always absorb something. And at the NGA step, the NGA material basically desorbs something. So it reacts as the expulsion on pressure amplification. So when you press on it, it reacts with a counter pressure. And that's why it's a very interesting isotropic counterintuitive um, behavior. And it means also that when you increase the pressure, the overall pressure is increased. So this is also a pressure amplifying material. And um, of course, we are still developing these materials further. And this is a material that is not published yet. It shows an NGA with nitrogen of more than 20 millimole per gram. So the expulsion is extremely high. And here I compare this, uh, or we compare this with traditional materials like HCAST1, ZSM5, a zeolite, and MOF5. And we see that it's of the same magnitude or even higher as compared to, to reference MOF materials. So it is quite a remarkable effect and, and interesting what switchable materials can do. Also, as a conclusion, why these two topics are related, 
ultra high porosity and switchability, more a global view. So for these option energies are normally quite small, 10 to 40 kilojoule per mole. And uh, that's uh, the definition of physics option. And this is not so different in ultra high porosity materials, but because the magnitude of adsorption is so huge, 60, 70, 80 millimole per gram, when you multiply this, the overall energetics per cell are enormous and they approach chemical bond energetics. And this is the reason why we can start to use physisorption to deform chemical bonds. And the coupling of physisorption phenomena and chemical bonding manipulations, I would say, is uh, from a fundamental point of view interesting, at least uh, in, in my view. To put this more in a visionary perspective, also for applications, I would like to give credit to the work of Matt Rosinski in Nature last year, who pointed out that the challenge is to design even more complex energy landscapes. I've talked about bistable potentials. A normal zeolite has basically a monostable potential, so a very steep minimum. Um, and this, this is the potential landscape. But enzymes and living objects have very complex um, energetic landscapes. And this is the way how they manage selectivity, selective recognition, a response, a very specific spe response to a certain molecule. And uh, this is, of course, mostly governed by hydrogen bonding interactions. And uh, Matt Rosinski has pointed out by making, he's making these fascinating hydrogen bonded uh, systems that they, um, of course, cannot be compared yet with um, um, proteins, but they go into this direction because they resemble a more complex energy landscape. And there is a more complex and interesting selectivity behavior, for example, in the um, selective uptake of certain organic molecules. And, and you can look at this uh, paper to, to analyze this. And um, with this outlook, I think there is a great potential for designing more complex, flexible materials for tuning their selectivity. CO2 and methane is just barely beginning and there are more complex and interesting molecules out to selectively um, recognize, but also the in silico design is very important to understand this type of um, selectivity. So with this, I would like to close my presentation. Of course, uh, I highly recognize all my highly talented co-workers. Um, the last presentation, last part was mainly um, work from Simon Krause and also Jack Evans, who contributed all the calculations. Vladimir Bond did most of the in situ work. Eike Brunner did the NMR work, um, but we also profit very much from international cooperation with uh, other cooperation partners I'm mentioning here. And there's also, of course, the funding from the DFG, which I would like to acknowledge the uh, German funding agency and the ERC advanced grant, the European funding agency that also um, supports this um, research. And um, lastly, I also take the opportunity to advertise the MOF 2020 conference or to announce basically the changes that we are currently discussing. Um, I think many of you are expecting what will happen with the MOF 2020 conference. And of course, due to the pandemic, um, we cannot proceed in, in organizing the conference um, as a real conference and a real conference um, event. That is quite sad and uh, frustrating for me. Um, but uh, what we have discussed and what is the um, what we will do in the future is we will postpone this conference by two years, the real event. And in order to help the community to discuss and exchange um, science, most recent science, we are currently in the progress of organizing a web conference, a web event, and um, you can find more information on the web page. Not at the moment, it's still under development because we are uh, still discussing the format and, and all the things, but uh, I hope we will have a very successful um, online event, at least as, as uh, not a substitute, but just to keep in touch. And then I hope that we will have a chance to also meet in person 
in 2022. And I hope uh, since, sincerely that you will also have the chance to visit my hometown Dresden in 2022. And thank you again for inviting me here at IIS and thank you for, for listening. Thank you. Thank you for the nice talk. We have two more questions from the first half and then some more from the second half. Um, I would start with a follow-up question from Haran Tesel regarding the selectivity of MOFs. Uh, she asked, would the same principle that worked for CO and nitrogen also work for CO and CO2 separation in the flexible MOF? Uh, in the example shown by Kitagawa, I think it will not work because um, the adsorption enthalpies are very different and um, probably um, the, the CO2 will be preferred, uh, um, will be adsorbed preferably as compared to the carbon monoxide. So um, the physisorption energetics in, uh, in the case of CO2 and CO are quite different. And therefore, the, I, I would guess, I'm not sure if uh, Kitagawa has uh, checked it but, um, or investigated it, but I would uh, estimate that it will be mostly governed by the physisorption energetics. Thank you. And there's one from Kim Sisikan. Is it possible to determine if a specific MOF will be able to have a switchability property based on its structure? Yeah, this is what we are dreaming of and we are um, sort of developing this. And I think, uh, let's say for the DOT 49 series, I, th I think we, we aim at uh, that we can understand it and uh, predict it. Um, so showing basically this slide here. So from these calculations in these well understood model systems, um, we would predict, for example, that if we synthesize this uh, OP form, that um, it, it would certainly contract under certain conditions. So, but um, the deformation energetics um, are often calculated by force fields. And uh, certainly it depends also on the uh, accuracy of the force field that you are using and how much it is, how good it is for a certain system. So for some metals, it's not so well developed. For some metals, it's quite easy and well developed. And um, I would also say that there are still open questions in terms of predicting the, the structural flexibility. For example, I mentioned the impact of particle size, of crystallite size. And this is something that is not included in any force field calculation. People are starting to do this. There's very nice work by Rojo Schmidt, for example, on the impact of the particle size. Um, but this is still under development. And if you have these two different factors, the in silico design basically estimates that the crystal is a perfect crystal, but then in the real system, you have uh, a finite crystal or maybe also defects, then there's a discrepancy between the model and the real material. And I think this is also part of the challenges, basically, the question, how adequate is your model and can it describe all effects that, that are important? But our goal is uh, exactly this, to develop a predictive model or predictive methods um, to predict switchability and selective recognition. Thank you. The next question is from Angel Hodrati. What is the role of nickel in adsorption apart from tailoring selective gate opening? Does it affect on the interaction between the solid and the gas molecules? Um, in this case, in our view, we think it is not uh, because um, the nickel is saturated and has no open metal sites. You can see this in this slide here. The nickel is coordinated to the carboxylates and to the DAPCO and has no open metal site. So there is no direct interaction. Um, there is the closest interaction is basically to the carboxylate oxygen. And in this way, it might affect a little bit the adsorption enthalpy. But to our knowledge, um, the strongest effect on tailoring the switchability, which is 
uh, I've shown here is the, um, are the deformation energetics. So the question, how easy it is, basically it's like a spring. You can imagine the hinge like is connected with the spring and the spring is different for the nickel and for the cobalt system. Thank you. The next question is from Ayat Sakel. Can the NGA be detected using breakthrough experiments for mixture separations? That's a difficult question. Um, I guess so, but um, I still need to think about probably you would also see an you would probably also see a step in your breakthrough measurement. We didn't try this so far because we are still stuck with single uh, component adsorption isotherms, but going to mixture adsorption is certainly the next step and we are very interested um, to do this. That's a very good suggestion. And um, yeah, we should do this. It's a good point. Thank you. Then again, there's a question from Angel Hujati. Can we observe a negative gas adsorption in gravimetric measurements at ambient conditions? Um, yes. Um, for example, for butane, you can measure butane adsorption in the in the micro balance, and uh, you can also see the negative gas adsorption there. There's a step in the in the in the weight, in the gas uptake in the weight. Thank you. Ram Prasad asks, did you observe NGA on DUT seventy five with the T shaped dry carboxylate linker with only a single carbazole unit, even if it's not so pronounced as in the case of DUT49 and its isorectular versions? Um, so far, we only detected uh, NGA in DUT49 analogs and DUT75 is not a DUT 49 analog. And so far we didn't detect it there. And, uh, but we are still on the, on the search uh, for new materials that also, that have a different topology. And, uh, but so far we are, it's still one of the open questions for us if the topology or the hierarchical pore structure is important. There is a theoretical paper by Jack Evans um, basically analyzing the impact of, uh, I'm not sure if I have this here, basically, anal yeah, this one here, <clears throat> basically analyzing the, the impact of pore size. And um, yeah, this is a little bit difficult to understand uh, easily this uh, slide, but here we have the bistable uh, profile and Jack Evans basically simulated this in a very general way. Um, saying that we don't need a spherical pore, we only need a slit pore. And basically with the, the springs that are connected to the pore wall and the molecules inside the pore, we model a bistable um, energy profile. And we only model the energy between the local um, minimum. This is the energy difference between the local and the global minimum. And we um, vary what we call the activation energy. This is the barrier between the OP form and the CP form. And um, what he found is that <clears throat> there's a very narrow range basically of materials showing NGA in a general way. And uh, it means basically that we need a certain ratio of the barrier to the uh, energetic difference. And uh, uh, this this was the outcome of, of this study. So in principle, it should be possible to observe this phenomenon starting from a certain bistability where there's a characteristic difference between the OP and the CP form and should be topology independent. But of course, we have to take into account that the topology must allow for the structural transformation. And um, this is something that is at the moment more difficult to analyze all the different topologies that can show the structural transformation. So we're still looking for new topologies that can also show NGA. And if you have a good suggestion, then we will certainly try it. Okay, thank you. 
And then there is one last comment from Malgorzata Kowalski. Most force fields are fitted to equilibrium properties, thus there's no reason that they can predict the gauge effect. Do you agree question. with that? Yeah. Most force fields are, well, um, I, uh, basically I'm not a theoretician. I would answer like this and uh, I think I'm, I would direct you directly to Jack Evans uh, for discussing about the accuracy of force fields or the inaccuracy of, uh, of uh, force fields. Um, so um, this is basically an, an estimation of the, um, of the energetics um, depending on the lattice constants and depending on the, the structural changes. And they, um, for example, in, in this case here, um, in this series here, when you look at the bistable um, potentials and so on that are derived from, from force fields, they are without any guess. So here there's no information about equilibrium or non-equilibrium, um, but maybe it's better to discuss this with a theoretician uh, about the fitting parameters of the different uh, force fields. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Stefan, for your presentation on switchability and ultra high porosity and MOFs. We also thank all of our attendees for joining this webinar and hope that it was both educational and enjoyable. Please join us tomorrow, Thursday, May 14th at our regular time, 10 a.m. New York time for a webinar on the screening of adsorbents by Professor Arvind Rajendran. Uh, he asked me to comment that this talk has been specifically designed for material scientists, and so it may be a very good webinar for our current audience to attend. And I hope that you can enjoy, enjoy, uh, can join us. The final webinar in this series will be on Monday, May 18th, presented by Camille Petit uh, at our usual time. Um, updates will be announced on the website of the Society and on Twitter. Uh, I also ask that you would please consider taking our survey at the URL noted on screen. Thank you and have an excellent day. <laughs>